there are more people in India today than there were on the whole planet when my parents were born. I think that is one way of sort of emphasizing what huge changes in population we've had in this one 45th millionth of the time there's been life on earth and how we've changed everything. So human numbers have an impact on diversity, on biodiversity, on land and in the sea, on climate mitigation and climate adaptation, and on virtually everything that we're talking about at this meeting that relates to the existential crises facing the world, the loss of the biosphere, hunger, access to education, jobs, and conflict. So improving family planning is the most cost-effective way to slow rapid population growth in a human rights framework. It reduces poverty by accelerating economic growth. It cuts maternal deaths by 50%, improves the quality of education, and makes it more likely the next generation will have satisfactory employment. As the 9-11 Commission uh, reminded us, a high ratio of young, poorly educated men is a recipe for conflict. Globally, family planning is not telling people what to do. It's giving them what they want. Globally, there are about 80 million more births and deaths each year. It's estimated that there are 120 million unintended pregnancies every year. Six out of 10 of these end in abortion and cause probably more than 20,000 preventable deaths. So women are telling us in blood that they do not have the access to family planning that is their birth rate. Making family planning easily and universally available should be as straightforward as vaccinating children against infections. Yet international family planning is seriously under, underfunded. Only 1% of foreign aid as tracked by the OECD goes to family planning, only 1%. I suggest that all of us that are concerned with existential risks adopt three simple policies. The first is whenever it's possible and appropriate, draw attention to the impact of population growth on a particular issue and the potential of investing in family planning to slow that growth. For example, there was a recent uh, paper by uh, Gibb, I think, in, in Nature about the spread of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. It concluded that the global, global changes in the mode and the intensity of land use are creating expanding hazardous interfaces between people, livestock, and wildlife reservoirs of zoonotic diseases. The authors did not add, but they should have added at that point, that it would be useful to increase in access to family planning and slow the spread of diseases such as COVID-19. The second opportunity I think we all enjoy is to lobby to double the proportion of overseas aid spent on family planning from 1% to 2%. That should be politically achievable. We're not threatening the other lobbyists who compared to over the 99% and only going to have 98%. But I think that um, transferring that, doubling th that investment from 1% to 2% of foreign aid would have a very significant impact on what happens in the rest of this century. Demographers estimate that if couples on average have half a child more than the current median projection for the year 2100, we would have a global population of about 16 billion, clearly totally unsustainable. If people on average had half a child fewer, then the global population would probably be about 6 billion, which would be much more valuable. So I think that doubling the money going into population would have a, a dramatic, important and uh, impact on the world we're living in and the existential uh, challenges we faced. The third um, possibility, which I would like to policy, I would like to emphasize, 
is something that Martin just said, that young people are 30 years ahead of the older people who uh, cohorts that command power on earth. And I, I find teaching younger people very inspiring. And I say to my classes, if my grandchildren are to live in a sustainable world, it's not going to be because of what I do, it's because of what you, the next generation of undergraduates do. So I would like to suggest that the Center for Existential Challenges probably tries to collect and share the teaching that's taking place in some universities um, on a sustainable world. The class I teach is, what is uh, it's called a sustainable world, colon, opportunities and challenges. The opportunities come before the challenges. And it's run by the students. The students select the student, they select the teachers, they um, run the discussion uh, sections. So I think that is you know, very, very important that we um, I've, you know, invest in young people and let them take charge. They are inspiring and committed and they are the solution, if there is a solution, to the existential challenges that we face. Thank you.